welcome back to the Citizen Channel and this is a, a part two, a little tribute in memory of Paul Hintz. So this is part two of that. As uh, yeah, my condolences to Paul's family and friends. I continue my little feature now on him. Uh, it's just uh, yeah, just a little tribute. Hope you enjoy it and uh, please. If you are new to the channel, if you can push that subscribe button, push the bell notification, great to have you on board. Make sure you go back and watch part one if you've not watched part one yet. Uh, of course, uh, if you can give me a little like, a little thumbs up, it will be much appreciated. Yes, in part one, according to the newspapers, uh, Paul was the new Jimmy Greaves. Yeah, a 3-0 win at Coventry on the 9th of September where he assisted goals for Bell and Buzzer as well as scoring one himself. Yes, the the, the papers were uh, full of it for him. Uh, he was a little bit embarrassed by it all, in fairness. But before we leave this game, back in 1977, City would run a feature in the matchday programme called My Dream Game. And Paul featured in the programme on the 3rd of September 1977, a game against Norwich. Interesting fact, this was a programme, of course, with swales on the cover, with all the City players and staff standing outside the main entrance, which has become quite uh, iconic over the years. Anyway, let's go, this is a thing, let's go over to this little uh, piece written by Paul Hintz uh, and listen to what he has to say about his dream game in his own words. It was an unexpected pleasure to be asked to recall my greatest game for City, most because in my short spell at Main Road I played more bad games than good ones. Seriously though, two games I played while wearing the famous blue shirt still stand out vividly in my mind, against West Brom towards the end of the season 66-67 and against Coventry early the following season. The reasons for remembering the West Brom game with affection will be obvious when I tell you it was my first team debut for the Blues and I astounded everyone at the club, particularly myself, by scoring both our goals in a 2-2 draw. But in the corridors of my mind, even that dream introduction to Leeds soccer will take second place to the game at Highfield Road on September the 9th, 1967, when I was outside right at the City team against Coventry. The reasons I recall the game are threefold. From a personal point of view, I felt it was the best game I'd ever played for City. Secondly, I scored a goal, and that turned out to be such a rare occurrence that it was bound to stick in my mind. Thirdly, and most important, I believe that was the day that all City players first convinced themselves that they were capable of winning the First Division Championship, as they duly did last season. If my memory serves me right, we had a disastrous start to the season, but had then slaughtered Southampton, Nottingham Forest and Newcastle, with Mike Summerby playing absolutely marvellously in his new centre-forward role. From the start of that game against Coventry, we could all sense that this was going to be City's day. I can still picture the grace of Neil Young, the awesome running power of Colin Bell and the way some of it tortured his marker, Tony Knapp. We could and should have been three goals up inside half an hour. I remember a tremendous drive from Bell which was kicked off the line by a Coventry defender. I should have scored two goals in the opening period myself. The first shot hit the legs of the Coventry keeper, Bill Glazier, and the second hit their full-back behind the ear and went for a corner. In fact, I did give City the lead just at, just before half-time with a goal which should have been disallowed. I remember clearly how some of it touched Young's pass into my stride with his hand. I just hit the ball without thinking and was as surprised as everyone else when the referee pointed to the centre spot. But after saying that, no one in the ground could say we didn't deserve to be in the lead. If anything, the second half was even more one-sided than the first. That great underrated character Tony Coleman and I managed to create a second goal for Summerby, and the old three lungs bell wrapped it up with a third goal after 70 minutes when he just ran through the commentary defence as if they weren't there. I wasn't destined to play many more first team games for the Blues after that but at least I have the satisfaction of knowing that for 90 minutes on an afternoon in September 1967 I played with a great team in every sense of the word, a team of champions in fact. So there you go, uh, he played at Main Road on the 13th of September in a, a League Cup uh, second round game. Uh, we beat Leicester 4-0 that day. Bowles got a couple of goals, booking Young in front of a crowd of 25,653. And it's back to league action for him. On the 16th of September, uh, we took on Sheffield United at Main Road. A 5-2 win. Uh, Bowles got a couple. Bell, some be Young, a crowd of 31,922. And then on the 23rd of September, yeah, a trip to Arsenal. Big crowd, 41,567. Uh, we lost 1-0 and he was subbed by David Connor. He was subbed uh, for David Connor. 
uh, coming on. And Paul said he knew the axe was coming after this. He said Alison had asked him to mark Gunner's winger Armstrong. I mean, he was a winger, Paul. He shouldn't be marking anybody, but hey, there you go. Uh, he must have been a bit scared of uh, Arsenal, Mr. Allison. And he ran him ragged, apparently, so he, he really did struggle. Uh, so he saw the writing was on the wall. But City was still riding high after this uh, this run of games. On his first game that he'd played that season, City had sat 21st next to bottom after four games. Before this Arsenal game, his last ever league appearance, uh, we were actually third. So, yeah, he put, he put some of that down to himself, and why not? By this game also, we did mention in part one, uh, he'd actually seemingly grown another two and a half inches. He was now five foot seven and a half inches. Uh, you remember in part one, his profile for City had put him at five foot five earlier the same season. So he must have sprouted. He must have been eating his vegetables. And uh, that was the Arsenal player profile. And I actually went on to say our fast-growing winger would also be soon be a candidate for the England under-23 honours. Well, perhaps not. This though, as said, he was saw he saw he saw coming would be his last league game, but he still featured in the League Cup until we were dumped out in West London. The starting eleven at Arsenal that day had been Dowd, Buck, Pardo, Doyle, Heslop, Oakes, Hintz, Bell, Summerby, Young, Coleman, and the sub, of course, who replaced him, uh, David Connor. United were next at Main Road on the 30th of September, and though he was in the team that was printed in the programme itself, which usually more or less was the team on in those days, the crowd of 62. 2,942 didn't get to see him oh, good thing really United 1-2-1 that one but Mercer and Allison did remain loyal to him in the League Cup and he still played alongside regular first teamers. There was no second string for cup games in those days. If you, if you were fit, you were played. You played. It was as simple as that. On the 11th of October, a crowd of 27,633 at Main Road watched a 1 1 draw with Blackpool. He played in that summer, be the scorer. Between this and the replay, he played at Molyneux in the reserves for the reserves in a 2 2 draw. The reserves, like the first team at the time, were doing pretty well. Alongside Paul for this game, we had the likes of Corrigan, Connor, Bowles, Sear and Bowyer. He kept his place for the first 11 for the replay at Bloomfield Road a week later on October the 18th and a crowd of 23,405 were there to see a 2-0 City win with some a bit and an own goal. But his final first team appearance again in the Cup was on the 1st of November away at Fulham in the fourth round of the League Cup in front of just 11,732. We lost this, went out of the League Cup, we lost 3-2 uh, with Colin Bell and Alan Oates getting our goals. The team that night in his very last appearance, uh, Dowd, Buck, Pardo, Doyle, Heslop, Oakes, Hintz, Bell, Summerby, Young, Coleman and the sub was Stan Horn. It was back to reserves for Paul. He would soon believe that any further opportunities was going to be rare as John Mercer brought in what he personally called his final piece of the City Jigsaw in October. We had a new number seven in the shape of Francis Lee. Not one to take things lying down. He made a big decision that he did in hindsight come to regret. Uh, you read his book. He met with Joe Mercer and asked, was asked to be put on the transfer list. Joe wanted him to stay and offered him more money on at least two separate occasions to do so. But Paul's mind was made up. He obviously went back to reserves, made some further reserve appearances, including 28th of October, a 4-1 win over Sheffield Wednesday at Hillsborough. On the 4th of November, a 2-0 win over Preston at home. The match report stated that at 0-0 with five minutes to play, Paul Hinn switched to playing in the middle to spread some of the enthusiasm around more liberally and then had a hand in the movement for the opening goal by Alfie Moss. Bowles added the second. On the 18th of November, it was part of a 2-1 main role win over Derby. A top two central league battle on the 25th of November at Goodison against Everton ended in a sound beating for Hintz and the boys 5-0 on December the 16th a 1-0 win over Bolton at Main Road and as the first team battled it out for the top four the central league form did start to deteriorate though due to injuries the City were forced to play more youth and amateur players December the 30th a 1-0 loss at Newcastle 6th of January a 2-2 home draw with Liverpool reserves 20th of January a home 2-1 win over Blackpool reserves Paul was on the score sheet with Chris Jones in the game where a young Tommy Boo was showing his worth in the first team game against Leicester City on the 17th of February 
an FA Cup fourth round game in, in the City News and Views section on page three, written by Jerry Harrison, under the simple subheading Gone, it stated Paul Hintz has signed for Charlton and scored in his first game. A professional with City for only 16 months after joining the club from a local amateur f- from local amateur football, Paul comes from Fallowfield and will eventually move down to London. But at the moment, he is still training with City. Yes, yeah, so he trained with City and actually he got the train down to play for Charlton. Uh, for a little while and that was that during City 67-68 title of the season Paul had made six league appearances scoring two goals he made four league cup appearances with no goals and 14 reserve team appearances scoring three goals he'd made of course the one First team appearance in 66-67, scoring that two de- them two debut goals. So he was on his way to Charlton for a fee of £37,500. Francis Lee had cost £60,000, do not forget. Paul signed for £45 per week basic, uh, though the Charlton manager had to convince his chairman to fork out such a princely sum. There was an initial problem with his medical. It looks as though the deal will fall through. So he returned to City, who've, who actually made the effort. Harry Godwin sorted out, made the effort to find a reason. Basically, uh, he'd taken Paul had taken four aspirin on an empty stomach uh, for a headache before he had his medical at Charlton. And this had screwed up the blood results. So it was all cleared up and the move was completed. As well as Charlton, he appeared for Berry, Crew, and Macclesfield. And on retiring from the game, Paul went back to journalism, working for the Manchester Evening News as a City correspondent, where he frequently referred to City as God's own club. Yeah, he was a wise man. And later became the chief sports writer and England correspondent. Paul retired from the Manchester Evening News in 2006 and he penned his book, which I've quoted from in this part and part one, in 2009, Memories of a Failed Footballer and a Crap Journalist. If you don't own it, please uh, try and get a copy. It's a great book and I will continue to feature this in my uh, City Book Club as well, hopefully over the next few years. Sadly, Paul Hins passed away on the 22nd of July 2023, aged 78 at his home. Please, uh, you share any memories you've got. It'd be great to hear from you about Paul Ince. Uh, I would have watched, uh, if not all his games, certainly most of them, uh, league games for City, uh, possibly for the reserves as well. I was going to a few reserve games at that age in, the, in those years as well. Possibly, my eyes weren't good at the time. I refused to wear glasses because I thought it wasn't very good to wear them. So when I was watching him, I probably mistook him myself for Stan Bowles or even Colin Bell, which uh, or poor Joe Mercer used to mistake him for. But uh, yeah, that was my rubbishy eyes. And, and they all had the same haircuts and the style. I think Stan Bowles and he both used to wear the shirts hanging outside the shorts. Or sometimes it was difficult to know who was who. But there you go. Paul Hintz, uh, all I can say is thank you and uh, rest in peace uh, please share your memories until we meet again that's one thing don't I please stay safe blues come on city bye for now